Hey, 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 Jake Hake here. I want to thank you for sharing your day with me. For day 29, we're heading down to Florida to talk about the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. I know they're no longer the Devil Rays. I just really like to think back when they had the neon colors, the purple, and like the neon yellow, you know, back in the day. In any case, the Rays were second in the AL East with a record of 99-63 and and a positive 195 run differential. Because the team is not full of household names, the category leaders were probably all ones that you're aware of. Randy Rosarena led the team in at-bats, triples, walks, and strikeouts and was tied for the most runs. Yandy Diaz was the other person he was tied with with runs and he also led the team in hits, doubles, total bases, batting average, on-base percentage, slugging, and on-base plus slugging. Isaac Paredes led the team in home runs and RBIs, while Josh Lowe led the team in stolen bases. Speaking of Josh Lowe, this guy performed a little better than big brother Nate, just by a little bit. He did crank three more home runs and have one more RBI. He also stole another 31 bases than Nate, but it's all good. Nate's not a base stealer. Nate is a walker. However, in Josh's first full year at the major league level, he's not considered a rookie anymore because he did surpass the number of at-bats and or games required to still be considered a rookie. He did very well contributing to this team and honestly helped him do pretty well, and he will look to build on that. However, he will absolutely need to be better against lefties or else he could find himself in somewhat of a platoon again. Someone else who is facing platoon play is Harold Ramirez. Now, this guy is sneaky good. The past two years, he has batted over 300, has produced at least six home runs. He doubled his home runs this past year, produced at least 58 RBIs, and also had at least 121 hits. So he also platoons, plays against righties, since against lefties. However, he could be a bigger part of the outfield this year as they did lose just a few people. But in any case, Lowe and Harold Ramirez, both sneaky good. Harold's not going to steal you bases. That's Josh's part. But Josh's batting average may not be as high as Harold. So we'll see how things go. Speaking of batting average, Isaac Paredes did not make you look at him because of his batting average. He made you look because of his power. This man spent his first few seasons in Detroit and really didn't have a way to a starting lineup position because some guy named Miguel Cabrera was at first, and then they drafted some guy from Arizona State, Spencer Torkelson, and then at third, you had, of course, the famous Jamer Candelario. We've talked about him multiple times before in this series. And then, you know, Colt Keith, he's second and third, Matt Verling. So in any case, Isaac Paredes wasn't getting the love. He really deserved. Now, again, he's not going to kill you with his batting average, but he's going to kill you with some home runs and some RBI production. In 250 games played with the Rays, he has hit 51 home runs and produced 140 RBIs. Paredes actually came over from the Tigers as the Rays sent Austin Meadows to the Motor City. You talk about return on investment. While, yes, Meadows had a lot of potential, he is absolutely not um, developed. He's not been able to overcome some of the things that have been stopping him from being a productive major leaguer. He is still in Detroit, and his brother Parker is going to be with him, so maybe that will help him. But in any case, Paredes is absolutely flourishing down in Tampa. And again, with that first, second, and third base eligibility, fantasy-wise, he will be able to play pretty much anywhere for you. And who knows? He may very well be your home run leader. Now let's talk about the bottom half of the sign-up. They're not household names, unless you're familiar with where they came from before landing with the Rays. They're not going to make you run to the waiver wire to pick them up because they may not be as useful fantasy-wise as they are in real life. These are the cogs that are going to help this Rays team compete, not win, but compete in the AL East, make the playoffs probably, and then again help these other big names that we talked about, Rosarina, Low, Yandy Diaz, help them achieve more of their stats. Some of these guys include Jose Siri, who did have 25 home runs. Jose Caballero, who came over from Seattle Mariners, who had 26 stolen bases. Also, Taylor Walls last year had 44 walks and 22 stolen bases. Ahmed Rosario came over. He's bounced around a few times. But the last good season he had was 2022 with the Cleveland Guardians or Indians. He did bat 289 with 86 runs scored and 11 stolen bases. And finally, Curtis Mead. He is a nice prospect in this rotation that they have at third base. Yandy Diaz can play first and third. They obviously have Junior Caminero, who is going to be the incumbent. He is going to be the guy who's going to come up, be caught up first. Mead and Caminero had cups of coffee with the team last year. They both performed decently well, but there's a 
lot more hype around Caminero. So I see him coming up. Mead might get a call later. He's probably going to have to move different positions as, again, third base may very well be blocked. As we transition to pitching, this was a Zach Elflin show. He led in everything except ERA, which went to Shane McClanahan before he got hurt. The holds went to Colin Poach and the saves went to Pete Fairbanks. Overall, this is a very strong pitching rotation. However, they're not the healthiest. There were several injuries last year that really prevented this team from firing on all cylinders. And I think if they had all their guys present and healthy, 100% ready to go, this team would have absolutely won the AL East and probably went a little further in the playoffs. I do want to talk about each of the guys that were hurt and so you can see what this team was missing at different parts in the year. To start the season off, Tyler Glasnow was absent. He did not make his debut until late May. So that right there shows you that you know, a month or so of baseball was missed by one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball. That probably cost him a few games, and with a 99-win season, the Orioles won 101 games. In that month span, they probably could have won another three games had Glasnow been pitching. Now, not blaming it all on him, I'm just saying that absolutely could have been the case. Someone else who got hurt or was not able to pitch as much for them was Jeffrey Springs. He got hurt in the middle of April and was out for the rest of the season. He was only able to make three starts. Now again, that's another three starts that could have been made to, to act as a stopgap between Springs and Glasnow coming back potentially three more wins. Again, not blaming it on the pitching, but just saying that these are three games that you don't think anything of because, oh, it's early in the season, but late in the season, obviously, came back to bite him a little bit. Drew Rasmussen that was hurt in mid-May also had to have surgery and has been out for a little bit. He was doing pretty well, having, a, I would say, a career year. Um, the Rays always seem to get some of the best out of their pitching. The fourth player in this unfortunate rotation of pitchers was Taj Bradley. He did miss all of August, and that was another group of games that absolutely came back to bite the Rays in the butt. Finally, the fifth guy, Shane McClanahan. He made it all the way until early August when he started having issues and had to be shut down. So that right there gives you four pitchers who missed chunks of the year, not just weeks, but chunks, like months of the year that absolutely could have played a vital role in getting this team over that hump. I really do think this could have been the best rotation in all of baseball. They could have definitely led the Rays to the best record in all of baseball. Speaking of records, I think the Aaron Savali trade is going to do nothing but improve the record moving forward for the Rays. He was doing well with the Indians, the AL Central. However, now he's coming to a much tougher division, the AL East. And you can definitely tell from the 10 games he was with the Rays last year after the trade, he did end up with a 5 plus ERA. However, he only had 11 walks and he did strike out 58 guys in 45 innings. So that's a good sign. The trade that brought Savali over sent Kyle Manzardo up to the Indians. I don't know where he's going to fit in there because Josh Naylor, last time I checked, is pretty good. Next guy we're talking about is Taj Bradley. He had to have his innings monitored because he was traveling between the majors and AAA, pitching every so often just to make sure he was still loose. But the Rays wanted to make sure this guy, this kid really, because he is so young, was making the most of his appearances. He did pitch 37 innings in the minors and 104 innings in the majors. The RA wasn't great. It was above five. However, he did strike out 129 in just those 104 innings. He did also walk 39, so that wasn't sexy, but there's a lot of good to come from Taj Bradley moving forward. He is going to start the year on the IL, so that's not great, but that's going to be something later for him to look at and say, what can I do to be healthier? What can I do to preserve my arm? And better yet, what can I do now that I'm healthy to do the very best for this team? The Rays have already added a few guys to the 60 DIL, Rasmussen, Springs, and McClanahan. However, Taj Bradley cannot be added or probably will not be added to the 15-day IL until opening day. So this is going to cause a little more angst around this rotation because some of these guys are not primed to be fully stretched out starters at this point in time. Some of these guys have not been starters per se, and have provided more long relief, which that's going to be a little more taxing on the bullpen. They do still have a lot of great guys, Pete Fairbanks, Colin Post, Jason Adam. They add a few new guys, Chris Davinsky, Phil Maton, who came in from the Astros. So if I mispronounce his name, it's okay, because he was an Astro. However, they lost a few arms, not only in the rotation, but also in the bullpen. We're going to get to those in a second. But overall, this bullpen is going to have to work a little harder until some of these main guys come back 
it's going to be a long year for them. Again, they're going to compete. I don't think they're going to win the division. Possibly a wild card, but let's go ahead and get to the additions. Ryan Pepio is one of those guys who came over in that trade for Tyler Glasnow. He is a secondary starter. He doesn't usually do a long game. He's not going to get you quality starts, but he could surprise us. I don't see that being a surprise, but he's, he's going to be okay. He's not going to be as good as he was in L.A. Also, Chris Davinsky we talked about, and Maton, who we talked about was an Astro. Also, Richie Palacios. This guy has a lot of speed, came over from the Cardinals organization. Johnny DeLuca also came over in the Tyler Glasgow trade, is hurt because he broke a bone in his hand. Jose Caballero has second base and shortstop eligibility and is coming off a 26 stolen base season. Finally, Ahmed Rosario has second base, shortstop, and outfield eligibility. He's going to be a player all over the diamond and has had good seasons with the Indians as he did hit over 280 with a few stolen bases and produced as he hit atop the lineup. And now the guys they lost, really two big bats, Luke Rayleigh and Manuel Margot, they could each do what they needed to, hitting home runs, they could steal some bases, they could contribute in a platoon role. The biggest arm they lost was Tyler Glasnow. They also lost bullpen arms, including Yanni Trinos, Andrew Kittridge, Jake Diekman, Jalen Beeks, and Robert Stevenson. All these guys could play pivotal roles as saves guys, closer guys, setup guys, long relief guys. Overall, I think the Rays are going to be good. They have good pitching, they have good hitting. They don't have enough to overcome, though. Once the pitchers come back around midseason, if they can get back into form and really give them a boost that second half, who knows what could happen. But I don't know if they have enough firepower to overcome the Yankees, to overcome the Blue Jays, especially the Blue Jay pitching. That's what I'm really worried about. But I think the Rays are going to compete. They could very well get a wild card. They absolutely had every opportunity to be a 100-plus win team last year, but injuries ravaged them. The final day of 30 teams in 30 days is going to be tomorrow as we talk about the Baltimore Orioles. We're going to travel to Maryland. I spent time in Maryland. I did not like my time in Maryland. So hopefully this next talk about the Orioles was better than my time in Maryland. In any case, I'm looking forward to day 30 of 30 teams in 30 days. This is Jake Cake, and I want to thank you for sharing part of your day with me.